Well, little Linus from Peanuts was talking to his big sister, Lucy, saying, when I grow up, I want to be a doctor. Lucy just looked at him and said, you can't be a doctor. Ha! You, there's no way you, you want to know why you can't be a doctor. Because you don't love mankind. Here's Linus' response. I love mankind. It's people I can't stand. Ever been you? Oh, it's people. They're the ones that are tough. My dad actually ran a factory for years. He was a partner in this company in Fullerton, California. And he uh, would always say to people when they'd ask, well, how do you like running a factory? He said, oh, I love running a factory if it wasn't for the people. Because where there's people, there's problems, right? The more people, the more problems. Now, think about what's going on in just America today. There's lots of people. There's lots of problems. And in fact, the more there are people, it seems, the more there are problems. And isn't it amazing that God decided that that would be the way He would save mankind in the day-to-day -day salvation? You understand that Jesus Christ dying on the cross, that is where you receive the salvation for your sins. He paid the price. He bled and died for you. It's His sacrifice. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But, there's that daily formation of spiritual growth. That's the working out your salvation with fear and trembling part. That right there is taking place in this body of believers called the church. And you think, oh, that's crazy. No way. Why would God, why would God bring people together? Because when you bring people together, what do you have? Problems. And the more people you bring together, the more problems, the more chance for disunity. And so you're like, well, why would Jesus ever design this so that the church would be the place that we would actually spiritually grow? Because he made this promise, right? We're two or more gathered together. I'm there. This whole idea of the Spirit being placed in us, that this is the place that he's going to work through, and that he gave us this command, love God with everything you got, love one another as you love yourself, and this is how it's going to happen. It's not just one or the other. You can't just love God. You've got to love it in com love him in community and love each other, because if you're loving each other, you are, as Jesus says, taking care of me. Because where you find the weakest and the need, neediest, you're going to find me there. And so he gives us this community, and you would think, no way is that a good plan, God. That is not a good plan. It's got to be a better plan. He's like, no, there's no other plan. This is plan A. There's no plan B. I'm giving you a community of people, and where there's people, there are going to be problems. But here's the really cool thing. Think about what's going on in the world today. There's so much division and so much hatred and so much uh, uh, negative, negativity and negative talk and people being slandered and people being put down. And yet in this place, when we gather together, there is so much love in here, right? There's something different. And I'm not just talking about Caddis, but Caddis is special. And if you've been here a little while, you know that. There's so much friendliness. There's so much warmth. There's so much love. There's something different. Not that we're perfect. And Julie, for whatever reason, likes to bring that up a lot. We're not a perfect people. And I'm like, Julie, you know, you only need to say that once during a service, not five times, because it's true, we're not. We're not, but still, there's something special, right? There's something warm, there's something good. And we learned last week that what God did on the day of Pentecost was set apart a group of people that grew that day to 5,000, no, 3,000, soon grew to 5,000, 3,000. And what he did was so miraculous, and there were all these signs and wonders happening. Remember, we talked about speaking in tongues, and we talked about that there were there were healings, and people that were dead were brought to life, and there's just crazy stuff happening. But the biggest miracle of all was that you could get 3,000 people to actually like each other. I oh, know, Jesus walking on water, that's a pretty good miracle. Feeding the 5,000, pretty good miracle. 3,000 people liking each other, that's a huge miracle. Right? It's, and you read in Acts, I think it's from 42 on in chapter 2, it's just talking about how crazy they love each other. They want to be together. They want to serve each other. They want to give up their property, sell it so they can help those in need. They want to be there for each other. It's crazy what we read. It's crazy good. And it's what we want. And we get a taste of it. And what we need to realize is, this is God's plan. This is how it's supposed to be. And so, if you're like, you know, Linus or my dad, and you're one of those people that are like, you know, I, I'd love the church if it wasn't for the people. Well, we'd miss something, right? We'd miss something. We'd missed 
the whole beauty of what God has designed because it's the people. This is the church. It's the people. It's us. We have a responsibility to be different than the world, and it's not just for our benefit. We love it in here. It's so cool to be together. We are, we are here on mission, right? We do life with Jesus in community. That's awesome, but we're on mission. We're, go, we're to go tell people about Jesus, and the biggest thing we can tell people is just the, just the life that we live. It's a story in itself that this community is different than the community out there in the world. Now, having said that, if we're going to be and continue to be that God-filled different community that loves each other and that we are not perfect, Julie, we're not there yet, then we need some training once in a while. And so we owe it to ourselves to every once in a while just pause and say, let's talk about what it looks like to be loving towards each other. How do we continue to keep the kind of culture that we have? How do we let... God's Spirit actually work among us and in us and through us to be what God has designed us to be. So let's talk about how we can love people. And not just any people. Let's talk specifically today about loving difficult people. Now please don't think I'm looking at you. I have to look at you, at somebody, right? I gotta look at somebody, you're like, oh man, he looked at me as soon as he said the word difficult. No, I didn't. In fact, if there was a mirror here, I think I'd be looking at myself like, difficult. You're difficult, Jeff. The reality, thank you, thank you. Yeah. I know who it was. I have a long memory, too. Difficult people are all around you. Now, don't point at them because you're one of them, right? We're all difficult in some way. I love this quote. It says, to dwell above with the saints we love, oh, that will be glory. But to dwell below with the saints we know, well, that's a different story. Right? Because here we are. We're, we all have our thing. We all have our differences, our idiosyncrasies. I love that word. We're, we're different. Right? And it's hard to get a whole bunch of people together, and we forget sometimes that we're filled with the Spirit of God, and that when we're together, His presence is greater, and He can do some amazing things, and He has this unity He wants for us, and it's great! We forget that sometimes, so we need to be trained in how to do what Paul says to do in Romans 12. I love Romans. It's a deep theological book, but when you get into the later chapters, he gets really, really practical. And so he's going to get practical with us this morning. He says, love must be sincere. Love, sincere. And we're like, yeah, we get that. That makes total sense. Genuine love. We all need genuine love. That's good stuff. Here's the problem. When you think of loving someone, like totally loving them and sincerely loving them and completely loving them, you're thinking about the close family that you might have. I know not everybody's blessed with that, but you might be thinking of your family. You might be thinking of your close friends. And it's easy to love the people you like. Am I right? But sincerely love, that has to include more than just the people you like. Do you remember when Jesus said this little thing like, turn the other cheek? Oh, we hate that one. But turning the other cheek, that, that requires you to uh, not lash back at them like you want to do. And remember when he said this? This is even worse. He said, love your enemies. Why did he say that? Because I want to love the people I like. My enemies, those are bad people. So here's the deal. What, what uh, Paul has done here in Romans chapter 12 is he has addressed and following the, the, that ending section there in 12, he is addressing three different groups of people. He is not just addressing the people you like, the people that get along with you, the people that you're closest to, because they're easy to like, but there's still some work that's involved, so he does give us a little bit of address. He does give us a little bit of lesson, lecture on the people that are your friends and family, close people to you. But he also addresses two other groups. Let me just briefly share with you the first group, the people you like, the last group, bad people, evil people, rotten people. He said, yeah, you got to love them, remember? you got to love your enemies. Remember, turn the other cheeks. you got to love them. He also addresses a middle group. Here's what I want to do. You don't, if, you, if you like taking notes, I'm going to go kind of rapidly through the list. You don't have to take notes on this. I just want to give you a taste of the verses I'm skipping over. 
So what he says is this, be devoted. These are people you like. Be devoted to them, honor them, serve them, hope for the best for them, be patient with them, pray for them, help them. And a lot of you are right now going, man, if he can go through that many verses that quickly, why doesn't he do that every Sunday? Hmm? So then he's going to go on and he's going to talk about not just the people you like. This stuff is, you got to work on friendship. Friendships don't aren't just like automatic. you got to work on them. But they're not the hardest people to deal with, right? Because you like them. You have something in common with them. He did at the end, so I'm going to jump to the end because I'm saving the middle for last. I'm going to jump to the end and I'm going to share the things that he says to do with enemies, people that are bad, people that have have uh, bad morals or live a different way than God has designed us to live, that kind of thing. All right, he has three pieces of advice for them. It is simple. Oh yeah, you should have hospitality. I forgot that one. Hospitality for people that you like. You should make peace when wronged. You don't take revenge. You remember that? Leave the revenge to God and respond to evil with good. Now there's a middle section though. And that middle section, that's where the difficult people fall. It's not the people that are evil that you have to love your enemies. And it's not the people that you, oh man, I love these people, I like these people, these are my peeps, to use Julie's favorite expression for worshiping, my peeps. These people, I like these people. These are the difficult people. Let me do it this way. Now, if you are taking notes, you can fill this in. That's your first blank. Good people who are easy to love, verses 9 to 13. So that's the first section there. There are good people around you, and they're easy to love. Genuine love, sincere love, that's a piece of cake with these people. Because you want to. Now, you don't want to with this last group of people. Those are bad people that are hard to love. Those are verses 17 to 21. They're they're just not easy to love. But we have a responsibility to love them. How else are they going to come to Christ? How else are we going to be the light to the world and save the world if we're not sharing with those who are not in agreement with us or, or are doing things that they shouldn't be doing. We've got to show them a better way. They certainly don't want to hear us lecture them. We have to demonstrate. We have to show them. We have to show them love. We have to teach them about the grace of God. All right, so bad people, hard to love. We know that we're on mission with those people. But did you know you're also on mission with those people that are sitting around you who are difficult? That's the middle section. So he's got you know, 14, 15, 16, three verses that he deals with good people. They are good people, right? They're good people. They're just hard to love. Now, now before you start labeling, oh, yeah, yeah, because they're needy, or no, no, I know, the, I know the hard people to love because they're annoying, or because uh, they talk too much, or because they don't talk enough, or because they're not like me, because they uh, have different views than I do, because they, they don't agree with me, because they didn't like my cooking, whatever it is. They're difficult people because, no, they're good people. They're just hard to love. This is the group I want us to focus in on, so we're going to look at those three verses. Now, in those three verses, there are actually four lessons that he gives. And to make it easier, easier to remember, let's, let's identify these four as ways to respond to difficult people without becoming difficult ourselves. These four can be classified as one lesson for the tongues, one lesson, that's your tongues, not speaking in tongues, that was last week, one lesson for our tongues, two lessons for our hearts, and one lesson for our minds. So tongues is actually the next blank in your notes that falls right above the next verse. So we've skipped down to those three verses now that have the four lessons. Here's the first one, verse 14, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Paul is repeating the words bless, 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 because it is so easy to curse. Now by curse, I'm not talking about <gasps> dirty words. <gasps> dirty words. I'm talking about the difference between blessing somebody, speaking some good, encouraging, truth, life, to that individual, being kind, looking out for their best interest, speaking kindness. Cursing then would be the opposite of that, which would be speaking against or lashing out. When you hear the word persecute, what comes to mind? Isn't it like somebody's beheading, you know, somebody from another religion's beheading somebody? That's, 
uh, persecution, especially if it's like Christian persecution. You hear that, right? You hear that word persecute and you think, oh, beheading, beheading, we're talking about beheadings here, bad stuff. The problem is this is in the second section and it's addressed to people that are mm, kind of difficult. We're not talking about beheadings here when we're talking about persecute here. In fact, I don't know if you know this or not, but it's impossible to bless somebody after you've been beheaded. Am I right? Okay. So we're actually talking about people who work against you, people who don't agree with you, people that might say something that they shouldn't have said about you or undermine you, work against you, against you. Bless those who go against you. Don't curse. Let me share how easy it is to curse or to lash out or be negative with those who are difficult in your life. Here's how easy it is. All you have to do, all you have to do is get into close proximity and open your mouth. Your tongue will do the rest. Am I right? You don't even have to try. You just open up that mouth when somebody messes with you, upsets you, goes against you. You just open up your mouth and you let it fly because that little monster inside your mouth can tear them to pieces in, in many different ways. They, ways you hadn't even thought of before. It's almost like it has a mind of its own. It's like, oh, have you ever done this? Have you ever gone, ooh, <laughs> that little jab I gave, that was a, that was a good one. You ever done that? Why? Because it's almost like it has its own mind. It's wittier than you once you let it loose. Here's what James says about the tongue, and this is this is pretty um, pretty crazy when you think about what God has done. He has designed you with a tongue that actually behaves like this. The tongue is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. That It's like the most evil part of your body. It corrupts the whole body. It sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. You don't even have a permit to carry one of these puppies and you can mow down an entire crowd with that thing in your mouth. Right? This is crazy. And, and, and the most important part of this talk that James has given us on the tongue, I haven't even said yet. Because your natural reaction to this is, yeah, I know, I can be really wicked and really sarcastic and really biting. That's why that's why I'm really good at holding my tongue. And I know that's what you're going to tell me, Jeff, just hold my tongue. And, and that's good because, because most of the time, I can hold that puppy back. I got those pearly lights like a prison cell just locking that thing down. It ain't getting out. Oh, yeah? then why did it get out? Well, I mean, it gets out once in a while. I mean, you know, every, 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 every wild dog sometimes breaks out of its cage. Yeah, but that means you can't control it, right? Well, I mean, I can't control it in that moment, but isn't that the moment that you need to control it the most? Yeah. There's something wrong. And let, let me share the next verse because I think this one is even more important. It says this, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are tamed and have been tamed by mankind. I don't know, that one of the coolest things going to the zoo, I don't know if you like the zoo, our family loves going to the zoo. Uh, when you see the dolphin show and the tricks that they can do, actually any of the water, if you go like to SeaWorld and you, and you see Shamu, and, and he goes up and kisses somebody that's standing there and then he rides somebody on their back and it's just crazy that you can... You can tame a killer orca well. Whale. Enunciate, Jeff. Whale. Crazy. Crazy. The other thing that I think is crazy is that you could actually tame cats. And I know you're thinking, no, you can't tame a cat. I got a cat. No way. I, this was crazy. On Angie and I honeymoon, we were down in Key West, and we, we along there they have all these street performers. And we saw some crazy street performers doing some weird stuff. But I, I tell you, the cat demonstration. That was the wildest thing. They actually had cats like sitting up on stools, sitting still, doing what he said, and then they'd jump down and jump through a hoop and do a black flip and get back up on their stool and sit. I'm like, those aren't cats. Those are dogs dressed up like cats. If you can tame a cat, you can tame any animal. His point is, you know, you can do this. You can tame animals, which some of them are really hard to tame, but you can do it. 
But no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. And so the idea is we got this thing in our mouths that are hurting people like crazy because we think we can control the tongue. I know your mama told you this. She said to you, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Anybody hear your mama say that before? Your mama's wrong. I'm sorry, did I say that? <sighs> I should have just clenched my teeth and held it back. Yeah, your mama is wrong according to Paul, because Paul says you got to bless that person. Blessing actually requires you to say something. You see, the cure to the problem with the tongue is not holding your tongue because you can't. It will get out. The cure is using your tongue for good. James even addresses this when he talks about, hey, how can a, a, a spigot can't produce, or a well, I think he says well, can't produce both fresh water and salt water, right? It, it's just impossible. So while you're speaking truth and good and encouraging words, you can't be cutting them down. This is really important. This is how we can bless others. Now, I'll give you a trick to blessing others. Each of you should have a prayer life where you're spending time with God, intimate time, talking to Him, and a lot of times that talk is all about you. Oh, God bless this, bless this, bless this. Why don't you use that to bless others? What if your prayer time, your private prayer time, was to pray for the person who's difficult in your life? I promise you, because I've done it myself, I wish I'd do it more, I don't do it enough. When I have done it, it changes me, which is the most important person to change in prayer, because everybody has free will. It changes me. So there's how you can bless somebody. So there's our first lesson. It has to do with the tongue. The next has to do with the heart. So that's the next blank. Actually, there's two of them that have to do with the heart. The first one is this. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. That sounds pretty straightforward, right? Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Actually, it sounds kind. It, it sounds natural. It sounds like we all should do this. This, this actually sounds easy. Come on, if a friend of mine has a victory in his life, I'm going to celebrate with him. And if he's hurting, I'm going to come alongside with him, spend some time with him, and we're going to hang out, and I'm going to help him through whatever he's going through. That sounds great until, until, until you realize we're not talking about the people that you really, really like. We're talking about people that are hard to love because this is in the second section. Think about this. There are people in your life that you, when you hear about a victory, you kind of give them a, yeah, that's great, a little congratulations, and then you move on, and you don't really celebrate with them, and you don't feel it with them. There are people that will tell you the trouble and the struggle they go through, and your reaction is, yeah, okay, I'm sorry for you, I'll pray for you, right? And then that's about it, and we don't really come alongside them like we do for people we really like. This is hard to do, it really is. To celebrate. Now, there's an extreme you could go with this. People that are really, really bad people and such, sometimes we actually rejoice in their pain and we, 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 uh, actually feel like bad when they have victories. And that's, that's, that's just sick. And if you, if you're there, you gotta deal with that. But I think on a day to day basis, there's a lot of times where we're just not compassionate for people. Or we're not, excited for their little victories when we should be. And again, I think this requires prayer. Like, we should have daily prayer time, right? But we also should pray without ceasing. And if you are wondering, when does that come into play? It comes into play when you see somebody who is 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 got something going on that they need someone with compassion to come alongside them and you're not feeling it for them. But you know, this is a good person, and this is somebody that I really should encourage. You say a prayer. You ask God to help you get excited for their need. Or you ask God to help you to have compassion for their hurt. Prayer is something that is a game changer. It should change you. Daily prayer, praying for that person that's difficult. In the moment prayers, praying that you can be there for them, celebrate with them as well as, as comfort them. All right, another one for the heart. Live in harmony with one another. This one is really important and very difficult. We live, like I said, in a day and time in which there's not much harmony out there, is there? And yet here, this is where it should be so different. 
This should be love one another, serve one another, be with one another, sell possessions, give to each other, just like in the early church. This should be what we're about, right? Total harmony, not like the world is. You realize, when I came and moved to Indiana, that was about 20 years ago, I think, or maybe more than that. When I first came, the only disunity that I really saw was between IU and Purdue fans. Well, there was a lot of it, but it all seemed to be kind of for fun, right? And, and, and the jokes were really good. That kind of disunity is fun. Now, here was one of the jokes that I liked, you know. How many IU football players does it take to change a light bulb? Just one. But he gets three hours credit for it. <laughs> That's a good one. Of course, the high-minded Purdue engineering folks are like, I don't get it. I don't get it. So that's fun. We can do that kind of stuff. But then you start getting into windmill disputes and you get into politics and things get ugly fast, don't they? One of the things that we have asked here is that we don't talk about windmills and politics here. Even though we all have opinions and we all have sides. And, and I've made mistakes in the past where I've stood up here and I've talked about a, a political party's platform and I felt really I actually, I was called out by somebody and was convicted by that. And, and, and so I made a decision. You know what? I am going to continue to teach what the Bible teaches, whether it lines up with the left or the right, but I'm not going to be political in it. And cause here's the reality. I'm going to step on your toes anyway, talking about the political things because it steps on my toes at times. It's tough stuff, what God says in His Word about how to live. But the last thing that I want to do is place a political platform or position over a relationship. There are some amazing people in this room. We have Democrats, Republicans in this room. There are some amazing people in this room that I call friends, that I respect and I love, and there is no way that I would want to bring disharmony to that relationship because I chose my political position over it. Now, I may hurt them or and, and, and on that side and this side, whatever, because of what God says, but I don't want it to be because of some political statement. Now, having said that, this, this whole idea of, of we need to make sure that we're in harmony with one another and that we're one with one another. It's not just because I value those friendships. It's because we're supposed to be a church. And the church isn't a building, it's people. And as the people of God, we have to be united because the world is watching us like crazy. We are different than the world. Can you imagine... In this room, think about this. There's Democrats and Republicans in this room all praising Jesus this morning. The world doesn't like that, regardless of what side of the political spectrum you are. They look at us as, that's not supposed to happen. You're supposed to accuse and hate one another. I'm sorry, Jesus would not do that. And we can't do that. And so we ask that you can have your opinions and your convictions, and I certainly do. And I know each of you do. But the most important conviction is the conviction of harmony and love for Jesus Christ. Amen? Alright, so that's for our hearts. By the way, that also takes prayer. It does. Because, I mean, you hear things sometimes and you're like, are you kidding me? And you want to, regardless of who you are, you, you know, whatever side, whatever, there's things that you hear that just go against your core values and convictions. Speaking the truth of love is not an easy thing to do. So we need to find ways to protect the unity, the relationships. All right, so that's hearts. Let's talk about minds. One more here. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. To Being proud is thinking that you're better than somebody. He says it twice. Paul likes to use duplicates. In this case, proud and conceited are the same. The application is in the middle. It's kind of like the Oreo cookie right there. So here's the, here's the problem we run into. We think we're not proud. I bet you most everybody in this room thinks, I am not a proud person. Some of you think you are the most not proud. <laughs> I'm the best at not being proud. Here's the test. It's very simple. 
Do you associate with people of low position? There is another way to translate that. It's a little unclear exactly how to translate. There's another way to translate low position or people of low position. Do you, are you willing to do men, uh, menial work, menial labor? Are you willing to do jobs that are beneath you? Are you willing to associate with anyone? Are you willing to do and serve anywhere? And if you, uh, if you want to apply that uh, principle right away, see Carrie May and sign up to clean toilets. She'll get you signed up. Are you willing to hang out with people that are different than you? Are you willing to do things that are uncomfortable? Again, I think that takes prayer, doesn't it? All right, so here, let's just review. We've got a lesson for the tongues, bless, not curse. A lesson for the heart, rejoice and mourn with. Lesson for the hearts, again, live in harmony. A lesson for the mind, don't think that you're better than others. I want you just to look at that list and identify. Would you consider this, please? Just identify something you struggle with. What's, what's the number one up there that you really have a hard time with? Because in a moment, I want us to pray together about these areas that we struggle with. And I, before I do so, though, I want to share with you the one that I struggle with. This was, um, this would have been a lot harder for me to pick the one I struggle with had something not happened to me this week. I, I, all four of these I struggle with. And maybe you're like me. It's like, yeah, um, that's hard to do, Jeff, because I, mm, some days it's this one, some days it's this one, right? Try to pick one. I'm going to share with you the one that I struggled with this week. Early in the week, I developed, I kid you not, I developed a sore on my tongue. And it hurt like crazy. And I don't know how it happened, whether I bit my tongue whether I ate a bunch of spicy foods, I have no idea. But if you called me this week, if you, because I didn't do a whole lot of calling this week, because it just absolutely hurt to talk. It feels a lot better this morning, praise God, but it was painful. And if you had called me, because some of you did, in fact, one day I had so many calls, I was like, are you kidding me? I hurt! One call after another, I'm like, ah, I'm talking on the phone going. And if you called me, you might have thought, we have a really, we have a bad connection because Jeff sounds like, well, okay. yeah, this is Jeff. <laughs> All right, I'm exaggerating just a little bit. Ah, it was, it was painful. And, and I'm thinking, God, you, you are like a comedian sometimes. I mean, I often have to wrestle through whatever my message is for that week. And here he's given me this sore on my tongue so that every time I talk, it hurts. And I'm typing out my message and writing my message on the tongue. God, what are you, what are you saying? And I'm like, oh, I get it, I get it. It's, it's an illustration. You want me to have an illustration. I so appreciate that. Thank you, God, for this illustration. The illustration basically is this. Just as I need my tongue to be healed, so do you. And yet, as the week went on, I realized this isn't an illustration. This is a revelation. I had a conversation with a friend this week in which I was talking about someone else. And I really wanted to get across my point, and it hurt like crazy to say what I said Every word hurt worse than any of the phone calls I'd had earlier in the week. And yet, through pain, I was able to get out and get my message across. And I can't label that conversation, that message, as anything other than gossip. Because that's what it was. And after that conversation is when it hit me. I just spent a whole lot of effort and a whole lot of pain 
trying to put somebody down. Not even pain could hold back the beast in my mouth. I realized in that moment, I've got problems with all of these. But God is calling out my tongue. He's saying, Jeff, that's where I want you to start. Had I chosen instead to do what I had been typing and writing about all week and bless that other person, all that pain would have been worth it. I don't know which one you're struggling with. I know which one I have to work on. What I want to do is invite you to do what I used to do more than I have lately. And that's our I'm statement. I'm praying for difficult people in my life. Would you join me and pray for difficult people in your life? Once you start praying for them, all the rest of them start to fall into place. You have more compassion for their hurt and their victories. You are more interested in the relationship than getting your point across. And you don't think of yourself so highly anymore because all of us have fallen. All of us need mercy. All of us are like that song that says, we're a wretch. I'm a wretch. I think you, if you examined your life, you would say, yeah, I'm a wretch too. We all need Jesus. So I want to invite you to come to Jesus. Maybe you need prayer in front of the church for things that you've said or for help with blessing people that are working against you. Whatever it is, we'd love to pray for you. Maybe you just need to come because you know you're a wretch and you need Jesus. You can't do this thing without Him that you want to be filled with Him. You want to walk with Him. You want to be changed by Him. You want to be a part of this community that is Spirit-filled, that is different than the world. And you want help to live the kind of life He calls us to, which includes loving all people, including difficult people. So I'm going to ask that you stand, and we're going to pray together. The team is going to assemble and then lead us in song, and that's when you come. Father God, we love you so much. And the reality is sometimes we don't show it by the actions we take. We're so sorry. Our tongues should be praising you all the time. We should be praying to you all the time. We should be in communion with you all the time. But there's many times where we forget or we're not. And that's when we get in trouble. And God, there's a lot of hurt that has been caused to people close to us, good people, good people. We're so sorry. Help us to love like Jesus loved. Because when we study his life, he spent most of his time with difficult people. God, help us to be that kind of church that welcomes in and encourages and strengthens that is a light in a city on a hill that is different than the world, that the world will just continue to knock on our doors wanting to come in because they see that we're different than the hate and the division they see in this world. God, I pray for you to be victorious in lives this morning. Call people forward in Jesus' name.